first, guys, I want to welcome, I want to welcome the great Nelson DeMille and his son Alex DeMille. Thank you. Had great to be here, guys. Both past guests, but first time together. Glad to have you guys. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Cheers. So, as I said, we've had you both on separately, um, but never together. And the discussion about bloodlines seems to be the the perfect time to remedy that. Uh, this is a huge, entertaining story with lots of moving parts and bigger personalities and hidden agendas. Um, but to start out, could you guys re provide us with a U2 spy plane view of what our listeners can expect from the pages? Sure. Dad, you want me to take that one? You can take that one, yeah. <laughs> um, at, at its heart, uh, Bloodlines is a murder mystery uh, set in Berlin. Uh, the main characters, the protagonists, are male-female Army CID investigators, Scott Brody and Maggie Taylor. This is their... Uh, second book with the two of them, the first being The Deserter from 2019. Uh, they are sent to Berlin because a colleague of theirs, a fellow Army CID agent, is found um, murdered in a park in a uh, part of Berlin that has a lot of um, recent um, Arab, Arab refugees. Um, it's partly known as, some people call it Little Damascus. Uh, it's technically called Nikon. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, even though I wrote that word. <laughs> <laughs> Five thousand times I never bothered to check, but um, so he, this, this guy is uh, this our senior army CID agent who lives who works in um, near Frankfurt is in Berlin is found murdered early morning in a park, um, and there's a lot of mysteries. Obviously, who killed him, but also what was he doing in Berlin in the first place? He didn't even have a case there. Um, he didn't bring his partner. He didn't tell his commanding officer what what he was doing. So it begins as a, a murder investigation, and as it goes. I think that the lens gets wider and wider as they start to uncover more and more, and they sort of start to dig into the history, history of Berlin, the history of the Cold War, um, into the more recent, you know, anti-immigrant neo-Nazi movement. It all kind of kind of weaves together um, into a broader um, conspiracy and something much more present and much more dangerous that they have to solve. That might be one of the best uh, author summaries we've ever had in their own books, I think, on, on this show. I, oh, honestly, thanks. thanks. No thanks. joke. No joke. Definitely the wine. Yeah. Well, and, and you, <laughs> the wine. Cheers to that. Cheers. And you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned the history and, and throughout this, the, as the saying goes, the past is not the past. The past is prologue. And while reading it, I, I, I felt that concept was ever present and always in the background. Um, was this sort of overarching in your thoughts as you mapped out the plot or did that aspect sort of evolve organically? Um, I mean, I I chose the setting of Berlin, and that was part of the reason I chose it. I mean, I always loved, I think one of the, one of the strengths of my dad's books over some other people who write in the same genre, um, what some, one, one of the things that sets him apart is the, uh, those deep dives into the locations he does, like Yemen uh, and the Panther, uh, you know, Libya, the history of Libya and the Lions game and the Lion and you know, et cetera. Um, you know, Russia and in, in, in the in the, the Charm School, which is one of my favorites of his books. Yeah, so, all of ours. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. So I knew, and and also growing up, you know, the 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 level of history and Cold War history, specifically the dad that you were you were always telling us about and teaching us. Um, one of my first trips to Europe was to Berlin with my father, so I definitely had that in mind uh, to, to to do that kind of deep dive as a. As in, in, in keeping with the, the best, the, one of the best qualities of his books. And uh, so definitely, I mean, this story is intricately layered and readers are rewarded as each layer that narrative is peeled back. Um, but as an author myself, I kept, I couldn't help but admire and appreciate the interconnectedness of the plot and like how it unfolded. And when I reached the last page, I found myself wondering if you had filled a notebook with plot points, charts, character arcs, and more and and nelson uh, alex was just mentioning like you do those deep historical dives into those places do you have a stack of those notebooks like behind you somewhere in the office of russia yemen and and such yeah. places yeah i do and i you know i was a history major alex was also a history major um and uh this is fascinating and uh i was talking to somebody the other day about you know all the historical references in the books that i am some people you know, some of the editors would say, you know, there's too much history here, but I know my readers, you know, the reader will find the author. The author doesn't have to chase the reader. And my books are what they are. And they're always, to, to the extent that I'm, I'm able to do it within the plot without publishing my research notes, I want to, you know, there's got to be an historical context. And I, um, you know, for people who are hopefully you know, literate readers who like to read, 
uh, contemporary fiction, but with some, you know, some background to it. And yeah, this is how I do most of my books. I, I do have a notebook full of uh, little, you know, little things that hit me once in a while. I had, I don't know if you guys read the Plum Island, which was the first oh, yeah, book. Oh yeah. Well, I won't give it away, but it's about. It seems to be about biological warfare, where you know Plum Island was a biological uh, warfare, not really biological research center, but they say bi biological warfare was done there. But uh, also, it's the area where Captain Kidd is supposed to bury his treasure. And I had these two ideas. I was in my, you know, in my notebooks. I tried to develop them. One day, I just put them together and I came up with a single book because it was set in the same area. But again, a historical. You know, the old Cold War uh, facility at Plum Island, plus Captain Kidd's treasure. And, um, you know, these books resonate. I mean, people have the choice of reading nonfiction, which I read most of. I, I shouldn't say that as a novelist, but, I, <laughs> but when you read fiction, you want to at least be, you want to be entertained. Of course, you want to be entertained, but you want to be enlightened and educated a little bit, too. And I get a lot of, uh, not a lot, but I get negative fan mail sometimes about people who complain. Uh, we don't need to know about this, that, or the other thing, or about the communists or whatever. Well, sometimes it's a theme of the book, and I hate to, you know, I don't want to challenge my readers too much. Most of them are good about it. They, they again, my readers have found me, but uh, but you'd be surprised of how many people uh, are really not into anything other than the moment. And there are writers who write of the moment and without any context, but. Uh, and I'm glad Alex picked it up. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear what he just said, that he actually listened to what I said. Uh, <laughs> and, the son well, listening to his over. father. <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny you say that because <laughs> one, one of the things that's characteristic about your work is that the, the research is there, but it's never forced in. It's never like yeah. you vomiting your research. It, it comes in organically. And I'll tell you, as a young man, I discovered a lot of my love for fiction or for nonfiction and history through fiction, um, through some of your work, through uh, David yeah. Morell's other one that I, I, there are certain novels I'll, I'll read and then I'll find myself going to the source material or to the thematic material. And then I go down a rabbit hole right. and you know, come up later. And, and that's honestly, it's one of the things I love about this book and, and about your work in general. Um, but it, it just struck me that, that you've had cr people criticize that because that, that's a, I don't understand I, that, John. Like, well, seriously. But, but people will criticize everything and anything at some point. Yep. Um, right. as, as readers delve into the narrative, um, they, they embark on this this very captivating journey through a complex plot featuring a diverse set of characters, old and new, uh, Lebanese mos mob mobsters in Berlin, Berlin police, FBI, CIA, the whole alphabet soup, neo Nazis, Baathist, Sunni Syrian, Stasi. I mean, it was it's it's <laughs> this amazing stew of of characters, yeah. um, and the story immerses you in this slow burning inferno that constantly threatens to erupt and you're always wondering when those eruptions are going to occur stakes you guys did a, such a great job with the stakes and making them higher more intriguing so it, it's clearly you we talked about your research and it's evident that you guys meticulously like put this story together can you kind of share some insights into both your research process and your outlining process do do you guys outline heavily or is this or is this intricate stuff do you guys write but i see your pants because if you do I'm, I'm gonna hate you both yeah seriously <laughs> uh i hate to say it but we kind of do a little bit i mean no way I mean, are you Brad, kidding you, me I mean, i've been i i've been i've been i think i've been uh dad i mean tell me if i'm wrong but you don't really outline very much i mean no, we, no, we, no, we, no, you're no. supposed to you're supposed to submit an outline you know for the book you know to get it obviously get it approved before we actually start writing but it's it maybe starts out very, very specific and then quickly gets like really, really vague, you know, as you go. <laughs> I, for this particular book, without giving anything away, I knew, it's like I knew point A and I knew point Z. Okay. Um, did not know how I was get, getting there, you know. Um, wow. But it's good to have that point Z because then you, you, you kind of get a sense if you're kind of getting off track or, okay, this is a red herring, but are we spending too much time? This is red herring taking us too far away and... You know, so I always had that, always had that. And he, and my, my dad's very good about the, about the focus too. Um, I think I, that was one of the big lessons from the deserter. I really, I did go off on a few tangents that ended up not in the book because he was like, let's you know, focus on the story. So this one, I was, I was a little bit more mindful of every little, every, every, every different, you know, 
thing we delve into, it all it just keeps needs to be moved forward. As long as we're moving, moving from point to point. Yeah. You know, yeah. So and Nelson, when you're when you're riding solo, is is that are you a are you pretty much a panther the whole time? Yeah, um, you know, um every book was different. Every book had a different genesis, every book had a different process. Um you know, some of them like some of the, my two Vietnam books, uh, Word of Honor and um uh Upcountry, you know, I kinda like I knew the I knew the material. I didn't have to do too much research. I kind of knew where it was going. Gold Coast, which was my literary book, uh, I kind of knew where that was going. But like the General's Daughter, that was made into a movie with John Travolta. It was a murder mystery, and I had no idea who killed. I was not even through the book, and I know who the murderer was. I said, "My God, you know, I should know that I'm writing a book." But I had no, I had no idea who it was. I had to go back through the book again. Uh, sometimes it's just a you know it's a journey of discovery, which is good. But you don't want to wander or meander. Uh, right. But you want to you know you don't want to. But sometimes if you know the book too well because you've outlined it too much, you're not taking advantage of some tangents that or different directions that you can go in. And also you're assuming the reader knows what you know, but what, what, what the reader does not. So you know it has to be like a surprise, surprise, surprise to. The author, you have to surprise yourself as an author in order for the reader to be surprised. Yeah. The process is a bit different. There are other people who say they outline very closely. Uh, other people, uh, you know, kind of wing it and they shoot from the hip. <laughs> Me, it's kind of a combination of both, depending on the book. Do you, do you ever do you ever find yourselves and is Alex and you as well? Do you ever find yourself um, in the middle of the second act and going, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here, and this is this is all turned into shit. <laughs> Every book. yourself, yeah. yeah. Every book, every book, yeah. 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 The second act is horrible. Yeah, <laughs> but, definitely. Well, uh, but it all, it all, read like reading this book, obviously, because we're talking about bloodlines. You, I don't, as a reader, I didn't feel that. As a writer, I know that that happens. But as a reader, there was no instance where it was kind of like, yeah, this is where he didn't know where the hell to go with the story. It just it flowed so smoothly. It was, uh, it was well done. But it's, but it's nice to know that you both feel that way. Thanks. <laughs> did, did having did having a collaborator make that second act those second act moments uh i don't want to say easier because that's that's <laughs> such a the wrong term but did it make it more navigable to have that other sounding board like hey where am i going here check me i mean do, do you guys do a lot of that yeah that was you know, that's a good point too and it did actually and i felt i felt that was a deserter too uh i'm i'm often lost in the second act and um alex was a screenwriter for many years so right. yep. You know, uh, you know, it's first act, second act, third act. You know, if you show the gun in the first act, you better use it in the third act. There's all these tropes that, you know, people use for yeah. any kind of, you know, drama, you know, whether it be on stage or, or movies or books. Um, and, you know, like in, in the publishing business, they call it the second second act sag. The book's sent to sag. So and then, you know, if you try to jazz it up you know maybe it is sounding good but it's not going anywhere it's not really focused so you know I mean, if somebody were to write a book on how to you know, on writing how to write it should concentrate on that second act that middle of the book that every author i know has a problem with and uh well i guess he's starting off with a lot of enthusiasm he got a great plot you know introducing your characters and you get to the day no month and you know you're already in your mind you know it's going to either be a shootout or it's going to be confrontation but it's what happens in the middle that uh, was tough. But there's the insurance question. Yeah, without it, I was able. We were able to go back and forth and say, why is this working? Why is this not working? Is this too long? Is this you know? Are we, 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 are we still focused and yet still keeping the reader's interest. So, yeah, there was, I think, I think I just I could, I could probably say that the middle third of uh, all of my books and probably this one too took more than 50% of our writing time. They, mm -hmm. they had to do that. 20% mm -hmm. for the beginning, 20% for the end. That was my math. And 60%. <laughs> it be the shortest part of the book. But... Hey, we're writers and readers. We don't, we don't do math. I don't do math. <laughs> don't do math. The third act always goes fast because you're up against the deadline. So you just... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think I think that I like that line, you know, if you show, you show the gun in the first act, you, you, you better use it in, in the third act. But... Um, I think Scott Scott Brody actually actually says that line 
yeah. in, in, in the story, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so, so may, maybe I'll direct this to you, Alex. So East German archives, the Stasi archives, mm -hmm. the official name for those archives is the, I looked it up. Um, I had looked it up at the German name is hilarious, but the federal commissioner for the records of the state security service of the former German democratic Republic. <laughs> um, so I, I saw that you had, uh, you, you were hesitant in pronouncing the German name of that neighborhood. I was wondering if you could give us the uh, German pronunciation of this, uh, of the Stasi archives. I don't think so. I think there might be too, too many consonants for that. <laughs> I think, I it's think funny. Gonna, sometimes I was I writing and I'm thinking about, about um, uh, what's his name? Scott Brick, who's, who's the, uh, reads the audio book. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking like, oh, poor Scott, you know, he's going to have to read this <laughs> word, you know? <laughs> That's hilarious. Cause I would, I would love, I would specifically, we, Scott has been on our show before. We think he's a fantastic yeah. uh, narrator. Um, if he had to, and I'll scroll the words uh, up on the screen so everybody can see, um, mm -hmm. it is, I'm not even exaggerating, probably, I don't know, a hundred different syllables in, in this word. And, and there's, it's, it's impossible to say, but anyway, so that's not even my question. I'm sorry. So th th these archives, they contain extensive records and documents related to the activity activities of the Stasi during the time of, uh, East Germany's existence. Mm -hmm. So, Alex, how long did it take for you to emerge from the rabbit hole you went down? I mean, you have when you were when you were like going to your research of that, because because you make references to the puzzle women, the shredded files. Because I know after I read Bloodlines, I would because I was I was fascinated by it. I went down several different rabbit holes, and I was amazed yeah. by what I found. Stuff that I didn't know um, actually existed. Yeah, I mean, it was it definitely I and. Mean, the one one of the rules is as my dad said don't publish your research but the other one is don't over research also because i mean i was there was a time where i'm like i'm enjoying myself too much and i'm right. not I'm, I'm procrastinating from writing the book like i don't actually need to know all of this you know i need to know i need to know enough to to come up with a story and, and make it feel real and come up with not come up with learn things that are specific things i never would have imagined on my own um yeah the puzzle women um these uh these germans who who work out of this office and they're, they're still doing it to this day um rifling through garbage bags of you know shredded files that were shredded by the stasi in the final days of the, of the german democratic republic um a lot of them were burned or whether they were lost but whatever's left you know and they're just kind of gluing and taping this stuff together and now they're using computers which is making it a little faster but um no are they it, still it was, are they still yeah, doing it they are yeah yeah, Fascinating. Um, I didn't one know of that. The, one of my one of the books. I'll plug one book that I was um, the, one of the best books I read on the subject, but also gave me a lot of inspiration. It's called Stasi Land by Anna Funder. Um, okay. I think she's Australian. I don't remember exactly, but she went. Yeah, so she went to the former East Germany in the in the nineties, um, inter interviewing people, and just just a really a nonfiction book, but written like in this kind of really kind of novelistic, uh, amazing style. But that 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 that's where I got a lot of information um kind of the, the feel of it and also some of the specifics but i have a, i have a scene that's at the stasi archives which i didn't you know never went to it's not something you even could go to as a tourist unless you kind of had a reason um but i have a friend yeah. of mine uh matt longo he's a political science professor he was writing his own book um about the fall of the wall the fall, the fall of the iron curtain more broadly um it's actually coming out next month called the picnic and I called him up or I WhatsApped him or whatever. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'm setting something in the Stasi file, the uh, authority building. Um, is that a place you've ever been to? Or do you know anything about it? He's like, Oh, I was there last week. <laughs> great. <laughs> He's like, it took me two years to get in there because of COVID. Um, uh -huh. I was there last week. So I said, great. Tell me everything. You know, what's the, what does the lobby look like? And, um, he, he one line he said to me, which I couldn't steal and put in the book, but he says the, the people that work there looked like librarians that could kill you with their bare hands was his was his way of putting it so it's kind of this weird mixture of banal and and kind of and kind of creepiness of, of this place that i thought was really interesting to, to I, you you put me you put me as a reader you put me there uh you know following scott brody in, into the building and i i was fascinated by it and like i said i went afterwards and i was like holy crap look at all this i didn't even realize that that place actually existed yeah yeah well, let's let's dive into the characters a little bit. So Scott Brody and Maggie Taylor, who I, I love both his characters, share a complex history. And at the start of the story, 
they're not working together. They're stationed in different states, bases with other colleagues. But Bloodlines is a sequel. Um, so it was essential to sort of ensure that the readers who haven't read the first book, The Deserter, which you all should read if you haven't read, right uh, can pick up this one and still gain an understanding of Scott and Maggie's intricate past. How did you approach making their backstory accessible to both new and returning readers? Uh, well, I, I'll take that. I mean, the problem with any series is that you want to tell some of the backstory because that's what makes it a series. Mm -hmm. But your editor is always saying, you know, move forward. But there, you know, of course, there's a moving forward. That's what you're supposed to do. But you want to, you know, at least uh, acknowledge the past. And um, when we created these characters out of whole cloth for the deserter, uh, our, our, our mandate, so to speak, from the publisher, they wanted, they wanted, the publisher wanted me to do a, you know, a um, uh, co-authored series, and they wanted, um, you know, they wanted uh, something that I was kind of familiar with, at least comfortable with, and I proposed. Army CID because they could go all over the world and they could be episodic and all that. And then I, when I signed Alex off, he says, I know nothing about this. <laughs> I want no part of this. And, <laughs> and I mentioned the number to him and then he said, well, let's talk, you know. <laughs> but he that. picked it up right away. And, uh, but you know, but that's one of the things I did, you know, did tell him up front. I said, you know, you're going to get some editorial pushback on, giving away too much uh, of, the, of the plot or the characters or what, what their background is. And sure enough, we did get some editorial notes that said, you know, that we need to know all of this about Brody and Taylor because reader, readers want to be able to think they can come into any one of the books in the series. Well, the series has only got two books so far. Third is underway. Um, anyhow, you just got to gotta use your own judgment. You know, how much is too much and how much is, or, or, or you know, you're not giving enough away to make it interesting to the people who are actually following it as a series. Some people are following it episodically or as a single standalone book. And they've got to read like standalone books, but you got to go back to the past. So you know, when you see them for the first time in this book, you know, they're kind of awkward because they've had a prior relationship and um, though not sexual, but they had a, there's a lot of sexual tension in the book. Yeah, you want, it's oh, gonna, yeah. Probably Maggie Taylor got to get it on. This is the, this is the question. <laughs> It's like the X Files, if you remember. Uh, I was saying, I was saying Moonlighting, yeah. but X Files Mulder, works too. Yeah. Mulder, Mulder, and Scully. Oh, yeah. and X Files. Scully, you know, yeah. I just it would frustrate me every week. Uh, <laughs> do it for God's sake, you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, again, this is, these are choices you make, and you guys right. So you know, every every day is a every every minute is a choice. You sit down, and it's like you know, it's a like binary. You got to make a choice. Got to make sure who says what to who. You know, where do you go from here? And you know, what is their relationship? And what are they, what are they, you know, what are they thinking about each other? At the you know, is that personal relationship that you hope is engrossing the reader while you're moving the plot forward? Because people ultimately, and all that has said to me, you know, fifty years ago, people want to read about people. They want to mm -hmm. read about people, and so no matter what you're writing whether it be fiction, nonfiction, biography, people want to know about these people because they can relate to people. The plot is great. American books tend to be overplotted and big plots, whereas British are more character driven. And um, it's another thing I mentioned to Alex when we first when he first started writing. If you can combine, you know, the the the, the, the big American plot and with the British smaller book of characterizations and put them together and do it successfully, you know, if you're going to be a successful writer, I think. Um, so. and, well, and, and those yeah. are the books I think we carry with us is there, there are books that have great plots, but shallow characters and, and, and they might, we might enjoy them when we're reading them, but as right. soon as we put them on the shelf that they're out of our mind. Right. And then the other way is like, sometimes there, there's a guy, I won't mention his name because it, it'll sound like a, uh, insult but there's a guy who writes great characters but i never really get invo invested in the plot hmm. and i'm just like man if you could if you could just combine with this guy over here that can't write a character to save his ass you guys have been <laughs> but no yeah i think you guys did a really good job of of you know because of the show we read a lot of books and i probably read 200 books between the deserter <laughs> and this book and so it was in a way it was like coming to it new and fresh 
And I think that you guys did a great job of reintroducing the characters without that was that, that I think satisfied both a new audience and an old audience. Yeah, did a, did a great job, and and I particularly am drawn to. Although Maggie Taylor sounds like a very beautiful woman, I love Scott Brody. I just think he's a fantastic character. Um, so, but anyway, um, Alex. So this is your second collaboration with your father. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there anything new you discovered about him <laughs> while you co-authored this story? Uh, that's a good question. Well, I think it was more. It was kind of getting. You know, it was like. It was like lesson number two. I think I got we got deeper into some of some of the stuff. I think I made you know, <clears throat> I'd like to think I made different. Uh, if I made mistakes in this book, they were different than the ones I made in the last book. And some some of them I corrected myself before they before it even got to him. <laughs> right. this book, the, the deserter we were doing more kind of faster backs and back and forths. This one I was whole. I was because my father was writing the maze at the same time. I was kind of working on this alone for longer stretches, and I'd give him this like big chapter dump and then we that's the, so by virtue of that we started having these kind of broader conversations about the story uh versus this is what should happen next or not happen and this you know etc um but as far as him as a storyteller i mean i didn't need to respect him more in that regard but it definitely i definitely found because this plot is so complex yeah. I, i'd get i'd lose i'd get myself lost i confuse myself and i'd say oh god if i'm if i'm confused like what is the what is the reader going to be you know in these moments and he was always this kind of grounding grounding force and saying remember that they learned this you know that yeah. they're that's still in their minds you, you you there's been months between you writing this chapter and this chapter but about two hours has passed in the book you know and and, and that kind of kind of keeping me uh focused and grounded in the characters and what how they're experiencing the story um it's just it's it hard to do it was very hard to do um and he's always been very good at it and he kind of so he was kind of a, a, a guide for that kind of thing um again plots are important plots keep us turning the pages but the reality of the characters keep making it feel like they're authentic and they're responding authentically to what's happening even if what's happening is totally crazy is um yeah it's important yeah well, well nelson we um you know, we're parents. And so, you know, I love my children and I'm proud of my children's accomplishments. But did Alex impress you? I mean, he impressed, you know, were you impressed by uh, everything he came up with, with the plot the and, and the Stasi stuff? Yeah. I was very impressed. I, yeah, but I, I don't just say that because he's listening. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn my window off. And yeah, I, it's like the family feud thing. <laughs> Alex, you're going to go in another room and you're going to go. I was always impressed by his screenplays. <laughs> Um, you know, Alex knows how to write. Um, the first book was more of a challenge because uh, we actually had a, had a prior co-author who I had to let go. And, uh, but the publisher already approved the plot and the characters. And so Alex got a kind of a, a kind of a messy project that, um, that was half done, not even half done, a quarter done and done badly. Plus, was military, and he, he, now he doesn't have any background in the military, but he, but he taught himself. So the first one was really um, a, a longer process than um, than you would think it would be for two people writing. It was actually didn't take half as long; it took twice as long. <laughs> uh, the second one, as Alex alluded to, was during COVID. And I had a book to write, and he had a book to write, and I said, "You know, already wrote, you already wrote one novel. You can write the second one on your own. <laughs> it's easy. Just uh, do what you did last time." And uh, but I was very impressed. Um, the plotting was more intricate than even I could have done. And I'm not a, you know, I'm a good plotter, but not a great plotter. Uh, the ambience of Berlin was something I would have done the same way. Um, he and I went Berlin together years ago, and he's been back a number of times. The characters again, we it helped that we already knew who they were from the first book. We kind of chiseled them out, and um, they were. Um, it's going to go on, you know, in an internal chronology, the book would have been five months past the deserter. And he, but he put it all together. And uh, uh, I said, you know, this is this is remarkable. I was <laughs> really impressed uh, that that kind of research. I'm not good with the computer, so I can't do a lot of, you know, internet research. I do it, let's say, either the old-fashioned way or somebody else to do it. But I like <laughs> to do some research, go right on the, you know, get on the internet, go find what he needs. And then, you know, within five minutes, have it, you know, have it uh, as part of the narrative. Um, so uh, I th I'm thinking to myself, maybe he can write all my books. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'm up to number 28. I'm, yeah, you are. Oh, my gosh. And Alex is like, what is the number, Dad? Tell me the number. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, 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 I love the fact that, because we know, uh, uh, Nelson, you, you do longhand, and you don't necessarily do no. the computer. So I wonder if Alex was printing out chapters and yeah. uh, walking them over. Driving them over, or you know, FedExing them, like here, here they are, pop, and let's let's go through it. Mostly emailing them to me, because um, I do have I do have an assistant, so she knows how to she knows how to pull up email and print yeah, yeah. Them, print out. And she would print them. My assistant would print out, and I would you know read it as a manuscript, and I would make my corrections, and um, and then uh, she would scan. My assistant would scan and send them back. Send the pages back, but also I have a couple of pages of general notes, and it worked that way. I, I became basically a glorified editor as right. opposed to a co-author. Uh, the first book we did co-author. This book I was just the editor, and I had been edited for you know twenty for fifty years and twenty seven books, so I, I I knew how to edit. I, I'm probably a better editor than most of my editors. I have younger editors who have this experience, so I can I can edit. And I can spot things, and I've been taught by editors, and I've been taught by other writers. So I, I, kind, of, I kind of enjoyed the process. I found myself actually enjoying reading Alex's uh, manuscript pages and editing, awesome. and not having to be the writer of it, just to be the editor of it. A little red pencil, a little yeah. tick here or there, a little, you know, a little note in the margin. It was much easier than, um, than writing a novel from the beginning, I tell you. Or inserting a joke. There was there was plenty of that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not yeah. the the gallows humor. The how 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 on earth are you going to make something like this funny? And, and sometimes he 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 figures it out. You know, a master of the gallows humor for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. I don't know what's funny about this, but I want to step back from this story for a moment because we all read the news. And Nelson, last year you guys alluded to it. You re you released the Maze, a John Corey novel that drew inspiration oh. for the real world. Gilgo Beach murders, which at the time were unsolved. However, in July of this year, uh, Rex Harmon was charged in connection with those crimes. Yeah. First, the, the timing seems uncanny and remarkable. Chris and I were saying John Corey had to play a role in this whole development. Yep. Uh, but we're eager to hear like your thoughts and emotions when the news of this these charges broke after all the time you spent on that novel. Yeah, well, I mean, and I I did a lot of interviewing. Um, wasn't you know I did a lot of interviewing of, uh, of Suffolk County police where where this, these murders took place, and uh, some DAs and um, this guy was totally off the radar. I mean, sometimes it shows that the truth is stranger than fiction. You know, some of the news reports said you know the FBI, he kind of fit the FBI profile. But I saw the FBI profile. He didn't fit it at all. I just trying to, yeah. you know, retrospect. They're trying to say, yeah, yeah, we we knew we knew he was kind of this kind of guy. No, he wasn't. Um, I, I was kind of shocked because um, he really came in from nowhere. I mean, the guy was an architect. He had a family. Didn't live in the basement. He had a you know had a wife, had a kid, two kids. Um, and it, there's more to the story because it's still the you know like why. Why did they miss this guy in the beginning? Because he had come to somebody's attention. Um, corruption, you always say, it's either corruption or incompetence. Um, and it might have been a little bit of both in, in this case. Um, but it was a, you know, it turns out that fiction is actually sometimes more interesting than truth, too. <laughs> I mean, you know, this guy was like, he was like dull. <laughs> and <it> was like, <laughs> You know, yeah. I mean, he's a little bit of a weirdo, but other than that, like, you know, like, what is his motivation? But I think there's more to the story, and uh, I'm not sure he was responsible for all those murders either. Uh, is that oh, that's of, interesting. Uh, yeah, that's well, what, I, I just I just read one of the people that sort of escaped him or whatever claimed that he would talk about the murders a lot and mention something about m multiple people being involved is his theory, quote. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so I'm wondering if, I'm, of course, I can't imagine that the guy wouldn't sing like crazy if he could benefit from it somehow. So, yeah, well, he, well, he hasn't been charged with all of the murders. It's only a, a it handful three. of them, right? Yeah, three. Yeah. He hasn't been charged with all of them. You know, when you when you base a novel on fact, there's always a, uh, there's always a, uh, problems there. The only time I ever did that uh, prior to this, prior to the maze, was uh, with uh, Nightfall, TWA, TWA eight hundred. 
a blow off a blow up off the coast of Long Island. Um, you're locked into the you know the reality, and uh, Nightfall really did follow all the facts. Everything was as it was. I didn't make up a lot of it. I made I made up just you know the kind of ending, uh, different ending because we had no ending to TWA and we don't really know what happened to it. But with this, you know, with, uh, the Gilgo Beach murders and the maze, I made up a lot of it. I you know changed names. People were still alive. The police chief who had been implicated uh, still out there. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, ex-police chief. Um, what I do it again, no, is, is, you know, these, what they call the Romana Clef, you know, the novel that tells the real story in, in fiction form of something that, that actually did happen. Um, it's, it's full of pitfalls and, uh, it, it could be good, but sometimes events overtake the novel. While I was writing the novel, I was saying to myself, this case is 10 years old. They're going to solve this case, and I'm only halfway through the book. And what do I, you know, like, what do I do? <laughs> and uh, but they didn't solve it then. They went, oh, thank God, it was two years later. But I'm glad yeah. they were solved. I'm glad there's, some, there's, there's, there's justice I, being done in some way. I honestly don't think it takes away from the book at all, though. I think it's kind of amazing that like <laughs> that you pick this thing. Because, I mean, people, a lot of people have forgotten about it. Well, if you live on Long Island, it's still kind of like, you know, it's out there. Uh, that's the other thing, you know, some things are local, are they really national? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it did become national news, there were documentaries made about it and that type of thing. Um, sometimes you get you get too close to a story and, you know, because I knew reporters from uh, News 12 Long Island and uh, one reporter gave me all her notes. Uh, I, I was kind of close to the story. I always said, you know, this will make a good story or this will make a bad story. <laughs> and um, and it was a challenge. You know, the maze was a challenge because it was based on truth. And then you start to think, well, yeah, I know these people. I know some of them. And uh, I really want to say that the ex-police chief of Suffolk County was, was a possible serial killer. <laughs> I mean, the guy might still have a gun license. For a <laughs> gun, you know? so, it's fiction. Yeah. It's fiction. It's, it's John Corey. It's fiction. It's fiction. <laughs> it's fiction. <laughs> um, all right. So returning to the uh, the art of storytelling. Um Nelson DeMille's distinct marks of sharp wit and biting humor permeate the narrative. So, Alex, I'm curious if this aspect of the storytelling came naturally to you as you collaborated on this book, that, that gallows humor, or is that something uh, you leaned on on pop for? I would say it was a little bit of both. Um, I mean, I think I've, I've, I have his voice in my head a little bit. I've grown up with him. Uh, his 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 pranks, his his kind of his kind of wise ass uh, <laughs> remarks about everyone and everything is in my head whether I want it or not. So it's, it's there, <laughs> but I'm not, I, I, but, but being able to pull it out at, at any moment, um, it always can be a little challenging. And, and on this, on the subject of, of craft, you know, this, this book and the deserter were written in the third person voice, um, which I chose deliberately because I, um, you know, my, my Scott Brody, he has some similarities to John Corey, you know, um, he's got some similar personality traits, but he's not the same guy. I didn't want to fall into the trap of trying to make, you know, just duplicate John Corey. Trying to, first of all, I wouldn't be able to do it, but even if I would, that wouldn't be that interesting. So I thought if we separate the voice that way right off the bat. Um, we can still capture some of that, some of that gallows humor, which again, a lot of that comes, from, I think, from being military, from my father, which I don't have experience with, but I do have experience being raised by a military <laughs> man. So I think <laughs> some of it's yeah. yeah, osmosis, yeah. Yeah, we've actually talked about that with a lot of um, both military mm -hmm. first responders. The, the gallows humor in medicine, military, and police work is—it's—it's. It's, I think it's a necessary thing for survival, and it, it just seems like people from that background write it better than anybody. And I'm not from that background, but I—I I do have a healthy gallows humor, so I don't know. You do must be from, must be from all the shit I read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's that's awesome. Um, so. Nell says, we discussed earlier, uh, so Bloodlines can be described as a detective mystery with international military thriller elements. And we, we've had several discussions on the show about the difference between mystery and thriller and, and, and what those elements are. But how did you and Alex collaborate to maintain the suspense and the pacing of the story? Because it, the pacing is unrelenting, and yet it's still a mystery. I mean, that, that, to, to me, that's a very difficult story difficult uh alchemy to to master and how did you guys go about that 
Well, yeah, right. Pacing is the other element. I mean, there's so many elements going to a novel, as you know, um, you know the plot, the storyline, the arc of the story, characterizations. Um, and I think one of the things that editors focus in on a lot is pacing. And it's one of the things I think a lot of authors, you know, even experienced authors don't, um, don't pay attention to, or it's kind of like in the back of their mind. But there is a pace to the novel. The problem with you know writing a novel or and and and, and, and to pace it right is that it may, the, the novel may be set in, a, in an internal chronology of let's say in this case a couple of weeks in, in Berlin, but it took over a year to write. So how do you pace a novel that took you a year to write to make it look like it's only two weeks? Uh, Alice is good on pacing, and I think that's because of the screenplays. In the screenplays, you get about 90 to 110 pages, <laughs> triple space with wide margins. you got to tell the whole story. I always say, uh, when a screenwriter takes two or three months to write, I could usually do before my first cup of coffee in the morning, you know, I mean, as a novelist. <laughs> that's not being fair. But, you know, his pacing was good. So uh, the pacing was mostly Alex's. I tend to overwrite and then chip away. But I think Alex is good with keeping the pace the way it should be without having to go back and, you know, take stuff out, take stuff out, take stuff out. Um, you know, again, I found myself uh, as, as, as his editor um, with a lot less to do this time than last time. Um, but getting back to the humor, too, you know, would, he, he would... He wouldn't usually ask me for help within the manuscript, but sometimes he'd make a marginal note, and I need a joke here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, had to, I had to come up with something funny. So. But it was, it, was a, it, was, it was a, you know, a, the first book was easier than I thought it was going to be. This book was even easier than that, and uh, most people don't have that experience when it comes to co-authoring. And co-authoring with a friend or a relative is not a good idea, but uh, it works. It worked. This is a, it was the... This is this breaks the rules, but it worked. It it, it absolutely worked. Um, Alex, I'm gonna direct this at you. And and as a guy with the screenwriting background, I definitely I, I definitely notice your pacing and how how that goes. So, were there moments during your writing process when you felt the need to dial back on the mystery elements and inject more action in a particular scene, like I don't know, opting for a gunshot, a punch to the nose, a kick to the nuts, what, whatever it was to keep <laughs> going? Do you have that little like alarm that goes off in your head as you're writing that, oh shit, something needs to happen here? Yeah, definitely. Um, but because it's a novel and not a screenplay, then I turn the alarm off and think, well, it's okay, it's a book. We can get, a, <laughs> get away with it a little more. At least it's not, the, the alarm, yeah. I, could, I could put a snooze on it or something, you know? Yeah. I there, there there was a few part, part, parts in this book that maybe some readers would, would you know classify as slow, but for me, writing them, like everything that's happening here, I find fascinating. So. Again, entertain yourself, um, and you will entertain the, the the readers that you find who are interested in what you're interested in. So, um, that said, you know there are times where action is needed to get you out of a out of a scene or out of a moment. Um, and there was a couple times in, in this book where at least one time I can think of where I was a little stuck on something, uh, and my dad suggested, you know, this is a time for it for this, you know, and it makes sense if it fits in the story and it helps the, it helps the pace It kind of helps again, propel the story forward. So as long as I think it's, it's not, um, inauthentic to the story you're telling, um, and it doesn't feel like it's coming out of left field, um, you can get away with it. But for sure, there were, there was times when I was, I was a little uneasy about the, 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 the pacing as, as it was coming, as it was going. Uh, this book is nearly nearly 500 pages, at least in the uh, uh, the advanced reader copy. Um, yeah. So, which it feels like 300. It that's, does. That's, yeah, that's what that's what I wanted to get to. It, the pacing is fantastic in it, and there was never any point in it where I felt because we're authors, it felt like there was a need to like throw in an action scene or or, or something. I never felt it was inauthentic, and I thought it was extremely well done. Um, yeah. but so Alex. What's on the immediate horizon for you? Will we wait? Ha will we have to wait? Oh, is it three years for uh, another one of this one? Uh, no, I think there's a, there's a contract now that tells me when. when the <laughs> so, Contracts, uh, you can you can blow those up. What you, I'm, I'm writing it now. Um, it's already been uh, the proposal's already been accepted, um, so I'm already starting on it. Um, I won't without giving too much away. It is 
um, this time it's going to be on the home front. It's going to be set in the U.S. It's okay. going to be about as much about the U.S. as this is about Germany and Berlin and the deserter was about Venezuela. I want to want to really get into it about America. So what's the you, what's you, the deadline? Is there drama in America? Are you? I don't know. If we could give a little bit more away, it's about artificial intelligence. Uh, okay. It's, uh, set in a, uh, a, uh, an army training area near Area 51 out west. And uh, the army is developing, you know, robotic uh, combatants, robotic yeah. soldiers. Yeah. And uh, the book starts with one of these robots uh, murders one of the scientists. It's a Frankenstein-type beginning where um, one of the scientists who was working on the, uh, the robots is actually murdered by one of them. And Scott Brody and Maggie Taylor were called in. They already know who the uh, the murderer is. It's a robot, so <laughs> they, they, actually, they actually interview this robot who has, like, who has all the. But, but it becomes a who done it of of well who who you know who, who, sure, who, sure. who who's the person behind this the the, the base is locked down. You're in this little island of of humanity in the middle of the you know you know uh, Mojave Desert or wherever. Um, right. So, so it is. It, it's going to be. The, it's going to be much more focused in this kind of this kind of community military community on edge while also being like at the forefront of um you know mil military technology as, as it's so, happening now. i'm going off on a tangent here but do you guys ever read the news and go did none of you sons of bitches ever watch a sci-fi movie in your entire yeah. life i mean yeah, it's right. like I, <laughs> I read about ai and i'm just like I, I just shake my head because i'm like this was all this was all spelled out in every sci-fi movie that i've grown up on is <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean it's uh, you know the, the re in the real world there's obviously lots of legitimate applications or else people wouldn't oh. be developing it mm -hmm. um, yeah of course sure. you have to guardrails no guard yeah you, you got the guardrails and also what is the what is, what is the mindset of the people um, money for, money That's for me part story. of what's interesting is what, what it also what how, how do how do human soldiers react to this you know i mean on some level maybe it's making your life easier maybe it's putting you not putting your you in much as much bodily harm in, in in you know in combat but there's other things to consider too so i think it's a, it's a rich rich thing to explore definitely yeah. so uh nelson our our viewers love not only to read your stories but uh watch them on the big and the small screen can you provide any insights into any upcoming adaptations or projects in development you could share maybe with us yeah well a lot of things are on hold because of the uh, the strike the writers strike um, but we were on the verge, I think, of doing a uh, deal with um, one of the networks for the John Corey series. But we had done it before, actually. The deal uh, had been done and then got a bad screenplay, which often happens, and it died. And uh, the, the, the studio came back, or the network came back, I should say, and wanted to redo it. Um, so we're working on that now and uh, to make Corey into a, into a series. Um, the Charm School, old Cold War thriller, uh, is being revived, and from the last I heard is that it's um, going to go ahead as a feature film. Wow. Some, some, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a studio, but it was a major producer, uh, wants to do a old Cold War thriller to bring back the Cold War, which has now become history, uh, and because very little has been done on the Cold War since it ended, or even... You know, there's, there's, there's no Cold War movies out there. They do plenty of World War II movies, but then somebody does the Cold War. So this uh, student, this uh, independent producer who has, has the money, uh, is getting a screenplay together. So those are the two. And then the new one, uh, well, the new one that I'm working on now, uh, has some movie interest even before it's, it's done, uh, which sometimes happens. It's always movie interest. It's, it's always movie. I think all of my 27 books have been optioned. By, by studios or independent producers. Some of them have gone to TV. The, um, the uh, Word of Honor was a TNT movie. May Day that I co-authored with Tom Block was a CBS TV movie of the week. And then of course General's Daughter was a feature film with John Travolta and Madeline Stowe. But it, all the other ones have been optioned, but no, none of them have been made for a variety of reasons, mostly having to do with bad screenplays. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, screenplay comes in, either the pilot is, or the screen treatment, or whatever it is, it was bad, and then they lose interest. Hollywood has a very short attention span. In there. 
Has anybody ever made the mental connection that, you know what, if we only knew a screenwriter that understood how Nelson Daniel thinks. <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 I wrote, I wrote a pilot for, logic, for a, a, ser- a series based on Plum Island. Okay, well, there you like go. A, you know, like a like a hour long or 45 minute, whatever, pilot, which was pretty faithful to the book, but kind of set it up as a, it could be a 10 hour, you know, serialized, like season one of a John Corey show kind of thing. I was in. But that's not the direction they went. They went in a bad direction, and then this whole thing died. So one, one <laughs> thing that we and we talked about this on the show a lot is is right now. I th- I think we are kind of in a golden age of adaptations in the sense that we've probably seen three or four adaptations in the last couple of years that are the most faithful and hey, coincidentally, the most successful adaptations. I I think the Boss series is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. I, think, uh, I think the most recent Reacher series is like actually captured the character for the first time. Yeah. Um, Jack Carr has been on our show and his, his terminal list was pretty faithful to the book. And guess what? When they do that, it yeah. works. Why? Because there's a built-in freaking fan base. I don't, I don't know why that's so hard, but I digress and I didn't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> what are you doing? It's raise a glass. Guys, because you made it through the, the main portion of our interview and unscathed. Uh, <laughs> great answers. Enjoyed Enjoyed all of that. But now we get into the the, the real meat of the show, the lightning round. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a question for both of you. So you managed to collaborate on a novel and still be on speaking turns, which if I think about that process would be like with my own father, that's quite a feat. Now with my sons, it would be great. With my father it wouldn't be so great. <laughs> um, but is there something that you can absolutely not do together? Talk politics. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you both don't agree on the mayor of New York City? I mean, come on. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we like him either. Either of us like him that much. But... One, of, one, of, one of us is more concerned. <laughs> for different reasons. For, for different reasons. <laughs> for politics. I, you know what's funny? That was going to be my guess. I, I thought it was either going to be talk politics or or cook because some people. <laughs> well, he doesn't. He doesn't cook. Okay. All right. He but he's got a great kitchen, so I cook here sometimes. Smart. There. Okay, so Alex, this one's for you. Outside of writing. What is something that you will never match the old man on? <laughs> mm. It's not cooking. <laughs> uh, so I have a, I have a, I have a daughter now. She's five. Um, and some, some of my best, I know we're supposed to be fast answers, so I'll try to be fast with this. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I'll, I'll say you know, <laughs> I, I would say he, he, he was excellent at, messing with me and screwing with my head when i was a kid and <laughs> teasing me in these elaborate ways and i have not i haven't gotten there yet with her and i don't think i ever will i mean she's very sensitive so i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to push it too much anyway but you know it's like lighting the fire on christmas eve and pretending like you're not going to put it out in time for santa to come down and you know, things like that then I, I haven't quite got i haven't come into my own yet on that one it's a parent. mastermind. You will. It's a it's a father's <laughs> thing. You, it's yeah. just a rite of passage. <laughs> my, my my younger brother screwed with my kids a bunch, and he was late to have a child in life, uh, as society would say. Right. And so now he has a he has, now he has a two year old, and I'm like I'm just planning on ways to screw with him and this kid because he like screws my kids all my life. I haven't come up with anything funny. Yeah. All right. well, the, the third one is for Nelson. Nelson, you have accomplished so much in this field, and by any measure, have been an incredible success. If you could go back and do it all again, what is one figurative or literal mountain that you would like to have added to your track record? Oh, gosh. Well, I would have liked to have um, written kind of my memoir, my um, not so much a memoir, but a, you know, well, yeah, a Vietnam memoir. I wanted to do something nonfiction. Um you know, uh, what was the name of that? Goodbye Doctors by William Manchester. He went back uh, to the Pacific Islands where he was an infantryman. It was a, an amazing book. And I thought, you know, I should chronicle that as nonfiction. But maybe it was kind of self-indulgent. Did anybody care? Maybe at the time people cared back in the 80s and 90s. That was kind of, the time has kind of passed, you know. But I, I might do it someday in my retirement, just write it for myself and... You know, but I would like to have gotten that published. Was Upcountry the closest thing to that from a fiction standpoint? Yeah, kind of Upcountry. Uh, Upcountry felt super personal to me as I read it. Um, yeah. So I, I, yeah. I, 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 I word of honor a little bit too. So uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I got it out that way, and that was a good way to get it out. And, uh, but, you know, you know how publishing works. I mean, if they pay me X for novels, they're going to pay me a dollar <laughs> Yeah, 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 for sure. Right? For sure. Well, well, Nelson, apparently the publishing doesn't even know how publishing works because I think in that Simon & Schuster uh, <laughs> merger, I think they they asked the well, someone, I'm not going to say name, uh, what makes a bestseller? And they're like, we just, we don't know. We have no idea. We have no <laughs> idea what the special sauce is. <laughs> well, you know, the, the joke in the, in the publishing business is that publishers don't like to advertise because they don't want strangers buying their books. You know? so, uh, I heard that 30 years ago, and it's actually, it was, I thought Still it was true. Funny. Still true. Know? All right. Uh, my turn. Um, so there are some really cool throwaway, not throwaway lines, but like funny lines, you know, because the humor in a Nelson and Alex the Mill story. Um, so, Alex, why did kamikaze pilots wear helmets? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good question. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give my give that to my dad because he that's his line. <laughs> Why did they? Tradition. <laughs> Tradition. Yeah, right. I was racking my brain, and that was the only one thing I could come up with. It's just because. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a government employee. Like, why do we do it this? Why are we doing it like this? Because we've always done it like this. <laughs> or or seatbelts for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nelson, so uh, book recommendation. Uh, what book would you recommend? Um, can you recommend a book that has a lasting impact on your writing? Oh, on my writing. Um, you know, almost any Hemingway book. I, you know, I read Hemingway. I, you know, I'm, I'm an, an older generation, obviously. I grew up on. Uh, Hemingway and um, and on, on other writers, but I think he was the one that influenced me the most in terms of uh, writing style. I don't write like Hemingway. I don't try to do the, 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 like reproduce a Hemingway uh, paragraph. Right. The, 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 they have contests doing that. Um, uh, as far as you know, my own personal philosophy was uh, it really was uh, George Orwell and, and, and also Anne Rand, 1984 with Orwell and uh, The Atlas Shrugged with Anne Rand, and I've given both those books. I gave them to Alex, uh, and I gave them to my daughter, and I gave them to my, I have a 16-year-old son. Um, they really changed my life in a lot of ways and uh, kind of changed my way of thinking. Um, their style, their writing style, I mean, Orwell was a good stylist. Uh, the British are generally good stylists. Uh, I don't, I tend not to read fiction now. One of the reasons is a lot of it is, a lot of contemporary fiction is crap anyway, but also just changes the way you, your writing, you don't want it to influence your writing, and you don't want to influence you negatively. So, um, you know, but uh, to get back to the question, I think, you know, uh, uh, maybe it was uh, more than any other author I can think of off the top of my head, it was Hemingway that at least made me interested in being a writer, if nothing else. We could spend a whole nother show, Sean, just talking about, or you know, 1984 and... Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Uh, but Hemingway makes me rem uh, it makes me think of the Cuban affair, right? Um, yeah. uh, the, the book you wrote a couple of years ago. Um, all right, so Alex, what was the working title of Bloodlines? Uh, the original title was No Man's Land. I was thinking about you know kind of the death strip, uh, the Berlin yeah. Wall, um, and then I realized David Baldacci wrote a book like called that. Oh. that <laughs> not that much earlier, maybe even with his CID character. I, I didn't. I haven't read it, but. Um, I thought that's too recent, and he's too big of an author to use that <laughs> title. I like this title better anyway, but yeah, and it's a better title. But you know what's funny about that is like I've written two short stories that were that I looked up, and they were both David Baldacci titles. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> he just writes too many books, so he's gonna <laughs> <them>. <laughs> exactly. exactly. He writes good books. Yeah. That's well, it. Gentlemen, well, gentlemen, this has been a pleasure, like it was each individual. But I, I love I love having you both on. God, okay. Yes, um, hell of a book. Uh, I'm I'm excited to see book three. I'm glad this is a series. And uh, cheers to Bloodlines. Uh, everybody needs to buy that. But go back and read The Deserter if you haven't, people. But thank you. Know, cheers. Lot, pleasure guys. great as always. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Really fun to talk to you. I thank you, gentlemen. Tonight. I had fun. <laughs> thank you so much. Christopher. That was, that was a hell of a fun night. Oh, my gosh, yes. Always an honor to speak with any author, but uh, someone with the prestige of Nelson the Mill and his outstanding, talented son. Uh, that was a really cool dynamic to watch the father and son sort of banter against each other and kind of gave us some insight into how they write together. Really cool stuff, Sean. Really amazing. Love the story. Loved everything about it. 
loved Alex, loved Nelson. The fact that we got to speak to one of the biggest writers in the genre is always an honor. Absolutely. Well, and as, and as we talked about the whole, we're both fathers and sons, and uh, that's a really cool dynamic to witness um, in this interview situation, but uh, and also to read to read the book that's clearly a collaboration between the two talents. But Bloodlines. Crew Reviews fans, pick up Bloodlines. Pick up The Deserter to make sure that you have the entree into this. Um, I, I have it too. It's right here. Do you? Really? That's amazing. I know. Um, but outstanding work, uh, outstanding book, and uh, again, hell of an interview. And a always a pleasure, my friend. I'd raise my glass, but it's empty. Well, I refilled it several times. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>